advertising is doing nothing but getting more expensive. It's getting harder and harder to get in front of people without paying the gatekeepers, the big tech gatekeepers. And so the more likely a customer is to come back to you and needing that product, the more likely you can actually build a viable long-term business. If you want to keep up with what's going on in the e-commerce industry, the best thing to do is to go straight to the source and ask, but where can you find a group of e-commerce business owners openly talking about their pain points, sharing tips about how they grow their businesses and combining their knowledge to solve problems together? Does such a mecca even exist? Andrew Udarian is here to tell you that it does. Andrew is the founder of e-commerce fuel. And on this episode of up next in commerce, he discusses how he built a community of more than 1,000 seven figure e-commerce business owners. Plus he shares all of the insights he's gathered along the way from questions about Amazon to a crash course in community building to the single metric he says should guide e-commerce businesses today. Andrew divulges some of the industry's best kept secrets and more in today's interview. Enjoy. Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. Respond quickly to changing customer needs with flexible e-commerce connected to marketing, sales, and service. Deliver intelligent commerce experiences your customers can trust across every channel. Together, we're ready for what's next in commerce. Learn more at salesforce.com slash commerce. Welcome back to Up Next in Commerce. This is your host, Stephanie Postles. And today we're joined by Andrew Udarian, the founder of eCommerce Fuel. Andrew, welcome. Hey, thanks, Stephanie. Appreciate you having me on. So is it a weird feeling, a podcaster being interviewed by a podcaster? Like, what are your thoughts right now? Uh, I think it's great. You have to do all the work and I can just sit back and relax. And and uh, it, well, unless you send some really pointed questions my way. So maybe I shouldn't be relaxed. So we'll see. Oh, yeah. uh, but- I don't know. <laughs> You might have to sit up straight and get ready. This might be intense. I, this may be. I need to yeah, stop slouching here. But no, I'm, it's good. Good to be on. It's fun to be on the other side of the mic for a change. So I want to dive into your company, e-commerce fuel. I looked at it and it seems awesome. It seems like you would have gathered so many insights from this company that you've built all around e-commerce. But I want to hear in your words, what is e-commerce fuel? E-commerce fuel, e-commerce fuel, we provide community content and capital to seven figure plus store owners. And so we do that through an online form, which is really the, the heartbeat of our community. We've got over a thousand uh, vetted store owners. And the idea was really just get a lot of people together that are doing this day in and day out that, uh, you know, we're running seven, our average store owners probably doing three or $4 million a year with their business. Uh, and so that's the community aspect. Uh, we also do a big event every year for our community. Through content, like you said, I'm a podcaster. I've been doing the e-commerce field podcast for seven years now, which is crazy. Wow. Uh, and then we have a capital arm as well where we invest in promising e-commerce businesses. We have you know, 20 investors that have a lot of similar experience or world-class experts and everything from you know, Facebook marketing to email marketing to, uh, you know, to product design. Uh, and so we invest in companies that we think are interesting. So that's, that's what we do at e-commerce fuel. That's such a cool model. So for your podcast, I think I saw you had over 300 episodes. Yeah, I think actually, I think we're, yes, we do. Um, been, like I said, been doing it since like July 2013. And yeah, been uh, been going at it for a while. It's been fun. Yeah, that was really cool to look at your backlog and the guests that you've had on. So your business model is really interesting how you have a capital arm and community. I mean, two things that I would say are very hot right now. Like everyone is always thinking about, of course, becoming investors. I mean, maybe at least here in Silicon Valley, that's everyone's dream, it seems like. And then building up a community is something that we've heard a lot of guests mention on the show, like how to properly build a community. What was your idea behind starting this business and having those different arms of the business? They came in stages. And so in a nutshell, I uh, left the corporate world and cut my teeth in e-commerce for starting in 2008 uh, on a couple of different e-commerce businesses and built those up. So uh, I, I had a sense of the space and nobody was was talking about e-commerce unless it was like from like a Home Depot or like a Lowe's or like a, like a you know Fortune 500 style. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I started writing about what it's like to grow an e-commerce business for uh, you know a small team or a single founder and developed a little bit of a following on the blog, started podcasting. And then from there, that kind of just naturally led to me meeting all these great people. And I thought, what if we got a bunch of people in a community together that had a, a, you know, some kind of uh, some, some vetting thresholds and just made sure everyone had some level of experience. And that launched the community and built that up over time. And then the capital arm is, is fairly recent, really recent. In fact, it's you know about five or six months old. And um, that just came as a natural extension of seeing all these interesting entrepreneurs that hopefully we'd built some trust and rapport with. 
uh, or that people knew about us from, uh, you know, from the time running the business. And then also just a really great group of investors who also had uh, not just money, but uh, a lot of like in the trenches experience and, and advice to lend. So it kind of came in stages. Yeah, that, that's really cool. From the, to start with the community aspect, what are the vetting um, procedures that people have to go through? Like, how do you know who to bring in to keep it a high quality community? Because I do think that's like the biggest problem, you know, when you're getting in on these Facebook groups or communities, you're like, oh my gosh, there's like everyone's in here and I'm actually not learning anything. So what does it look like to get into your community? Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, if I can only do one thing well in a community, it would be bring the right people into it. And so our guidelines are they're a little nuanced, but you need to be operating a seven-figure business. Uh, if you have a very proprietary product that you've made from scratch or that is a little harder to make, sometimes we'll take people in the, uh, you know, kind of the mid to high six-figure range. If you're selling just on Amazon, usually we require a little bit more than that. So that's on the revenue threshold sides. And so it's, you know, we just, we keep it uh, no major SaaS vendors. And then for service providers, we're really careful. I'd probably say we, only 10% of our applicants that we accept are service providers and they need to be recommended by an existing member. An amazing email marketing expert that knows the space, uh, that is respectful of people and isn't going to come in a hard pitch and is going to build relationships mm -hmm. the right way through adding value is a huge asset. But we want to make sure that those are the type of people we have and not people just trying to you know, get a new, sign somebody up in the first day. Yep. That's really important. How many people are in your community now? We have about 1,100 members in the community. Okay. And how did you go about building that up? Like, what is your method of bringing new people into the community? How do you get in front of people and even tell them about e-commerce fuel? You know, community building is interesting. It's, you've got this chicken and an egg problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way that I did it was when I was blogging and podcasting uh, early on about e-commerce, just over that, you know, probably 12 month period, uh, really focused on not trying to monetize the business or anything, just trying to build authority, get a little bit of a reputation and connect with people. And over the course of a year, you know, just naturally organically met about 100 to 150 really interesting people. And anytime I did, I just, you know, put a little tag on them in Gmail and say community seed member. And so mm -hmm. a year in, I had this list of 150 people and I, I reached out to them and said, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'm joining, you know, starting a community. Are you interested? And then over the course of about 30 to 45 days, I dripped in, I added, uh, you know, about four or five people per day. I, I bring them in, I introduce them. Uh, I'd introduce them to other people. I'd ask them questions, kickstart discussions, and it kind of so it gradually grew. Uh, I didn't just drop everyone in at once. And it took about, yeah, like I said, about 45 days, but we had a, a bit of a community at that point. And then from there, uh, I had, again, you know, over the last year, built up some traffic to the website, was able to put up a, a page that said, hey, here's the community, you can join. Uh, and that gave us kind of, because you need both things, right? Like in community, you have to have new people come in because you always have a drop off, even in the most healthy. And so, from there, it was able to kind of, uh, with a lot of work, get to self-sustaining within probably probably 18 to 24 months. Wow. Yeah, that's great. And is it a paid community? It is. Yes, it's a paid okay. community. So it's, yeah, it is. It's $99 that, that also a helps. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure that also helps with like quality and bringing in people who are serious and, you know, really want to learn and contribute to get their money's worth. Oh, it helps so much. I mean, for a couple of reasons. I mean, we have, just like you said, like on the, on the, the vetting side, like, yeah, it shows that people are actually serious about this. The other nice thing is it gives us the resources to do things like hire a real community manager. We have someone full-time that their whole job is just to, to, to help vet people, to make sure that if people have questions that don't get answered, they can loop in the right people. Um, it lets us invest in technology. We've probably poured six figures plus into the custom tech for the community. So yeah, it's, it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, that, that's really cool. When it comes to keeping the community engaged because to me that's like one of the biggest things to make sure people keep renewing their membership and they want to you know check in every day and see what's new and see who's talking how do you go about keeping them engaged and maybe what have you seen works and what didn't work like any tests that you've done where you're like we tried this and this failed or we tried this and this really increased engagement a lot and you know helped keep it going two things the first thing is to actually have discussions and content that are highly relevant to what people are doing day in and day out so if you, again kind of going back to if you get the right people in the same room, that's 80 to 90% of the battle. From that point, setting up custom notifications is really important. So some of that custom tech that we talked about, when people sign up, we don't just blast them with every single discussion that pops up. That's crazy, right? They just drowned in a fire hose because we have like 5,000 comments every yeah. month from there. But yeah. we do try to figure out like, hey, what are you an expert in and what are you interested in learning about? And then when they join, we tailor their notifications to, to, to try to create the highest level of you know, a signal to noise ratio possible. And so that's another thing. The third thing is, is, is just 
maintaining a really respectful environment. Like we have a, a pretty strict, you know, no jerks rule. Like I get, I probably shouldn't say this, but I get a lot of pleasure out of throwing people who are just downright disrespectful and, and just, you know, kind of just generally unpleasant out of our community yeah, because they're good. horrible. Boot them. <laughs> you know, and also like non-solicitation, right? Like we kind of have a one strike, you know, one warning. And then if you do it again, you're out. So we don't put up with pitches. You know, if people are hard pitching stuff, they're out. So I think those are the yep. big things that help with maintaining an active community where people keep coming back to. Yeah, those are such good points. And it's not only applicable to like your business, but even thinking about any e-commerce business of like how to build up. I mean, you know, everyone talks about building these communities, but how do you actually make it helpful and personalize it to people in a way that, you know, people want to engage on your social media posts or they want to engage on your blog or, you know, tag themselves wherever they're at in your clothing or with your mug or whatever. So I think these lessons actually can apply across industries as well and not just, you know, upon building a community like you're doing. Yeah. Community building, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like a brand. Well, it is a brand. It's, uh, it's insanely hard to get up and running. Like the amount of time, you just, the amount of time and energy and love and, and relational work that you need to put in, I don't say it in a bad way, but just building relationships takes a tremendous amount of work. It takes a ton of time, just like building a brand, but it's insanely defensible. I mean, if you're willing to put in that, you know, if you have a multi-year approach, you can't steal people's friends. Right. Like, yeah. and that's what happens when you, when you, whether you're building a community for your, your brand or, or kind of a micro niche community like this for e-commerce fuel, so people come in and they start because they get value and they stick around for a couple months, but then they come to an event, they connect with people via PM and they, they build genuine friends. And like, you'd be hard pressed to tear me away from my good friends. And it's, it's really defensible in that regard. So. Yep. Yeah. Great. I love that. So you probably get a lot of, um, really good insights into the world of e-commerce and where things are headed just by some of the questions some of the members in your community are asking each other. And I want to know what kind of top questions do you see occurring right now where it's like quite a few people are asking the same type of question or these same themes keep popping up? Yeah. Let's start with the 500 pound gorilla in, in the e-commerce space and that's Amazon. Yep. Some of the questions I think people are asking on there is how do I, I'll just go through a handful of them um, and then maybe we can, we can talk about ones that are most interesting to you. But if I'm selling to wholesalers, should I let them sell on Amazon? How do I control my brand identity on Amazon? Um, there's some interesting stuff popping up right now about how, I don't know if you've noticed this, uh, but Amazon Prime used to be, you know, for a while it was like free shipping. That was two days and that was one day. And now it's like yep. the three to five days if you're lucky, depending on where yeah, you live. I did notice that. And I was like, ah, what's happening here? Like, usually I can get my stuff for my son in like a day. And now it's taken a week. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And, and, you know, of course, because just with, with COVID, e-commerce is blowing up, the capacity is limited on the, supply, on the delivery networks. But it's interesting because it kind of levels the playing field at this moment in time for independent brands because the shipping factor is not so much of an issue. And in fact, if somebody gives you something and takes it away, it's, it's worse than if they just had never given you anything to begin with, right? Yep. <laughs> and so, yep. Yeah, I feel way more sad right now than I ever would have before this. Exactly, right? Like, because the expectation is there. And so that's creating an interesting opportunity. Um, one of the things Amazon just recently came out with, I think the last couple of days was uh, reintroducing way back, I don't know, two, three, four, I don't know how many years ago, multiple years ago, you used to be able to ship your products from Amazon's warehouses to customers, like if you mm -hmm. even, you could use them as a 3PL fulfillment center without Amazon branded boxes. They changed that for many years. And just this week, I think they changed back to saying, oh, actually you can use our, our fulfillment services with your own proprietary boxes, or at least with unbranded boxes. Um, and I think potentially, who knows why they did it. It was kind of perplexing to a lot of people, but perhaps because they realized that this is, you know, that they're losing on the shipping game and, and other merchants maybe are starting to migrate other places. And if independent merchants are able to deliver the same shipping without Amazon, maybe more of them will move off. And one thing that we've done, we've done, we've done a state of the merchant report for the last three years. And our, yep. our one for this year should be hopefully coming out fairly soon. But a trend that is really noticeable is the number of people that are going to Amazon is really, it's not reversing, but it's plateauing very significantly. And even, even just chatting with merchants and seeing a lot of case studies, people are taking a lot harder look at like, is it worth like going on Amazon for how much channel risk you take on? how much loss of control of the consumer that you, you give up, you know, addresses, all these things. They're just taking a lot harder look at, is this good for my business long-term? Yeah. So do you think 2020 will show that a lot of people are pulling back from Amazon? That is a good question. I think not a lot of people, but I do think when we released the report, I made this prediction in the report too. So very likely could just, you know, be 
uh, you know, following my base in the mud here, but I think the percentage of people who sell on Amazon was about 55% of all stores that we surveyed last time. I think that will decrease a small amount. I don't think we're going to see a precipitous drop, but I think it goes from 55% to maybe 54 or 53. I think we start to see that inflection point. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. The one thing I also read in your 2019 report was about um, the different marketing channels that people were using. And I saw that Amazon ads had the highest ROI, but not many people are using it. So I'm wondering what are your thoughts around um, yeah, that aspect of like using it as a marketing tool? Yeah, no, it's, uh, wow, good, good prep work. Um, <laughs> they, if you're on Amazon, uh, Amazon ads, you have a, people reported them being the most effective uh, sales channel that they use. And so if you're on the platform, I mean, it's, uh, they work really well. So definitely should be doing that if you're on the platform. I think it's just more of a, it's not a question so much of like, should we use Amazon ads if you're on the platform? You absolutely should. It's more of a question of, do we want to be on Amazon in the first place? But yeah, for people selling on Amazon, they work, they work really well. Yeah. Okay. But then the other interesting thing I saw was that the average order value was way lower for, because if it's maybe a direct to consumer site or anywhere else, people can maybe stack on additional things from your brand where I think I saw on Amazon, the average order value was much lower, which makes me think like you're not getting that like, hey, you should maybe also try this for my brand and this for my brand as well and kind of increase the cart value. I think that that could definitely be part of it. I think part of a, a big part of it too is that if you have people on Prime, there's no free shipping threshold, right? Like, have you ever ordered like a, uh, what's a good example here? Like a $3 koozie uh, and it shows <laughs> yeah. up and you're like, how did they pay for the shipping for this? They lost money on this. Or you, or even better, like, you know, you order like a $7 a paperweight set that weighs like 10 pounds and they ship it. And it's just, there's no threshold. And so it's, it's easy to impulse buy small stuff on Amazon. Yep. Whereas if you're buying That's from an independent point. merchant, not always, but more often than not, you're going to have some kind of free shipping threshold. And so either you're intentionally going to seek it out or you're buying multiple things. So I think that probably also has a big, a big part in, in why those order, order values are different. Oh, that's, that's a good point. That's a good reason to look further into data and not just look really quickly like I did through the report. <laughs> so what other trends are you thinking are happening either right now, because a lot's been changing because of COVID and things are kind of just, you know, all over the place where people, some people are struggling, some people aren't. It seems like the market is changing quickly. What other trends or things happening do you see that people are surfacing in your community? Or are you building into your next uh, report coming out? Yeah. So, you know, e-commerce, obviously no surprise here is just exploding. And we, we did a survey. This was in March when like the world was falling apart. Nobody knew what was happening and it was a, much more uncertainty than there even was now. And you kind of saw a very big dip when, for the first probably week when, when COVID really started spiking and being taken seriously. And then you saw kind of half and half, half the businesses were doing okay, are growing and half were failing. And now I'd say you definitely have some uh, some businesses that are, that are really struggling. If you're in the event space, if you sell, you know, items into the event space, any of those kind of in-person things are having a hard time. But by and large, I'd say most of our stores are doing, you know, most of the industries are doing really well. Um, so that's fantastic. One thing that's, that's tough, that's a downside, and anyone who's selling is probably going to be aware of is just the sales tax issue in the United States. It's just an absolute disaster. Just Tell me a bit about that. Because it's just a whether... dumpster fire. <laughs> I don't know if I, well, I actually probably have avoided anytime I see tax. I'm like, oh, oh no, thank you. So I would love for you to dive in a bit and tell me like, why is the sales tax a disaster? Because I have not kept up with that. Yeah. So I'll try to be somewhat brief because we could probably talk about this for quite a while. The, up until, you know, two or three years ago, the only, only places you had to collect sales tax for was if you had Nexus in a, in a state. So if you had you know, I, I run a business out of uh, Montana and Arizona. And so Montana doesn't collect sales tax. And so traditionally we've only had to collect sales tax in Arizona. There's a big Supreme Court case that came across in 2017 or 18, uh, it was Wayfair versus South Dakota. And pretty much the, the, the shakeout from that was that the Supreme Court said that states can require sellers that are outside of their state. They have no physical presence in their state. Uh, if they sell to a customer within their state, they can collect sales tax on them if they reach a certain threshold, uh, if they sell a, either a certain dollar volume into that state, or if they have a certain number of, a minimum number of transactions for that state. And it could be as low as like 200 transactions and 50 to $100,000. Uh, and so the problem that causes is that now you have companies who create this economic nexus and now all of a sudden they have to be responsible for submitting, collecting and submitting sales tax, not just to 50 states, 
but to potentially sometimes all these different municipalities and cities and it just creates a disaster of a compliance thing. And so you've got companies that have sprung up to, to try to deal with that. And on top of that, if you sell on Amazon, technically, if you have inventory, like you, normally you send your inventory into Amazon and they a lot of times will split it up in like, you know, let's say three or four warehouses so it can be delivered quickly. Well, technically now, if you have those inventory in those four states, you have nexus in those states and you have to also collect sales tax. So it just, on the Amazon oh, front, on the independent front, it's just created, we don't have any central governance for this. What I think would be best is if the federal government kind of took it over and said, hey, we'll create a, a national sales tax or redistribute. But at the moment, you either have to deal with an insane amount of complexity, especially as you get larger, or you have to run the risks of being out of compliance and facing huge fines. It's a really rough place to be. Wow. How are you seeing um, e-commerce companies tackle this? Because that is not something that I've even, even like thought about, honestly. And it kind of scares me to ever start an e-commerce store now. Yeah, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways. Sometimes there's places, uh, I have a company called the Tax Ballet that helps out. They do a really good job uh, of kind of more of a personal hands-on approach to doing this. Some merchants will use SaaS software like Taxify or TaxJar uh, to be able to do that kind of stuff, Avalara as well. And some people just roll the dice and say, hey, uh, this is a nightmare. I'm not going to try to deal with this. And so there's a lot of different it depends on your risk tolerance, depends how big you are, but people are taking a lot of different approaches to it. But to do it right. Yeah, hire someone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hire but, someone or, or really go deep on the, the SaaS side of things and, and, and dive in. So, Yeah, yeah that sounds messy. So earlier, um, you were talking about the hallowing out of e-commerce. And I wanted you to talk a bit about that because we're talking still about the trends and what it's going to look like in the future. And I thought you had an interesting take on that. So I'd love for you to uh, go over that if you could. So, and again, of course, totally could be wrong here, but when I look forward into the future, I feel like e-commerce is going to be hollowed out in the sense that you have, on one side, you have brands on Amazon that sell either one of two things. They're either well-known national brands, Tide, for example, because could sell on there, or Rubbermaid or Adidas. Brands, people like, you know, household names. They sell on there because it's just, they know that brand, they go find it, they want to buy it. You have people who are selling really small things, like we're talking about koozies, or you need a stapler, or... Maybe you need a little backyard pool for the fact that your cousins are coming over and you really don't care if it breaks in, you know, in, in three weeks. And so you buy that. But then for anything in the middle, that's like kind of not a huge national brand, but also something that you want to have that's quality. I think a lot of those companies are going to start, people are going to buy much more from the companies themselves, direct to consumer. And so because they can merchandise them better, the shopping and checkout experiences are getting easier. I think brands are increasingly not going to sell on Amazon because there's in addition to all the things we talked about, you also have huge IP issues and people ripping you off. And so I think that's going to be the hollowing out of e-commerce where Amazon's going to be a big donut. And in the middle, a lot of people are going to be selling directly on their own sites just because it makes, makes more sense and for all the reasons I mentioned. Yeah, that's interesting. We've also talked a bit about the conscious consumer that's kind of rising out of all this and how people are starting to care about like, what is the source of this product? Is it actually like sustainable? Is it a quality product? And are less about like, can I have more and more like focused on quality and sustainability. Have you heard that trend as well in your community? Yeah, I would say, I think that's something that's been kind of a gradually increasing over the last five to 10 years. I think more than anything, how it ties into our conversation is that Amazon over the last couple of years, uh, and they've been fighting it and they've, they've done some to their credit, they've done some things to combat it, but they still have a, I think a, if you buy something on Amazon, most people are not going to think it's, it's, there's a little bit of a, of a thought that it's probably not high, high quality, a little bit of a stigma for buying stuff on Amazon, especially if it's not a name brand. Yeah. Even the name brands, people wonder if it's like, is this a legit name brand? I've seen that a lot in comments and um, reviews. Oh, totally. Partially because of review manipulation, partially because of counterfeiting, and partially because there's just a lot of, I mean, there's everything on Amazon. So how do you filter through it, right? So yeah. So I think, and that's part of going back to that trend about the hauling out of e-commerce, unless it's brand you absolutely have faith in, or it's something you don't care about the quality, would you rather buy one of those, those borderline things from Amazon and, run, run, and you know, roll the dice, uh, roll the dice with an unproven brand, roll the dice with kind of one of those mid-tier items being counterfeited, or especially if you can get it just as quickly, either because Amazon is shipping stuff really slowly, or because increasingly independent merchants can deliver it more quickly with some of these other options, buy it straight from the horse. And so, or straight, you know, right straight from the source rather. So, um, yeah, I think that's, for me, that's how the quality issue ties in, I think, to the, the big, larger discussion. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Do you think that is why 
the drop shipping model has kind of decreased. I saw in your report that that um, is not as big of a thing as it used to be. And I just remember at least like, maybe even like last year, a couple, over the last couple of years, that was like a huge thing. Like everyone just said, like start an e-commerce company and just drop ship things and like let other people take care of it for you. Like, what are you seeing with the drop shipping trend? Yeah. So when we talk about drop shipping, I think it's important to differentiate between two different things that come into people's minds. One is drop shipping. You can, you can build a great high quality business based around drop shipping. A couple of the businesses I started were drop shipping based businesses. Uh, one of them still under a great new owner is still, still doing well. And really at, at the end of the day, it's, it's less about the product quality and more about how it's delivered. So like Home Depot, for example, they drop ship a ton of their stuff. Some of their even big name brands because they can't afford to hold everything in stock. And so, and that, and that can potentially work out reasonably well. Uh, I think where it got a really bad reputation is with the AliExpress style of things. Yes. And so where- That's the stuff I read. <laughs> yeah, right. And that's, that's a whole different ball game. And, and for people who, you know, if you're not aware, uh, familiar with that, the 30 second version is you go onto AliExpress, which lets you pretty much ship products directly from the factory in China to consumers in the US very cheaply through kind of some, some loopholes in the postal service. Uh, and you can set up, spin up a store really quickly, but by and large, the products are garbage. They're just crappy. And, and so that I think is where uh, there's a big rise in that. People ran that for a while, tried to run with that, but the problems were you couldn't build a brand about it around it because the products were, were awful. And because it took weeks to get your product to your customer. Um, and probably because most likely if you're launching one of those businesses, you know nothing about the product. <laughs> yep. Never yeah. seen it. You don't even know if it'll make it or not. <laughs> yeah. But even on the other side, I'd say that all the time, even if you're looking at just rawly the, even if you're selling really good quality products, Amazon in the last five years has completely solved distribution. For a while, it sold trolling motors, sold CB radios. And back in those days, you really could get a business up and running purely by sourcing a relationship with, with a wholesaler, uh, doing a decent amount of marketing, having not you know, reasonable customer service, and you were in business. But like today, if you know what you want to buy, uh, you know the brand, uh, and you want it at a fair price, uh, you know, at a reasonable quickly, you're probably going to go to Amazon uh, for something you discreetly know that you want. And so Amazon's solved, at least before COVID, and probably still, I'd say, a large degree, they solved distribution. So you gotta, how do you add value? You got to add value through some other way. Usually that's through a lot of education uh, or a really curated product line if you're going to sell existing products, and those can be harder to, to get right. So I don't think drop shipping is completely dead, but I think it's gotten significantly harder versus even just two or three years ago. Yep. Yeah, that makes sense. So one question I always try to ask on here is about metrics and data. And with access to your community, I want to know what kind of metrics do people um, talk about as like their success metrics? Or what do you hear people debating about when it comes to like metrics behind um, if a business is doing well or not? Yeah, I think the one everyone loves to talk about is revenue, right? But I think that's mm -hmm. probably a pretty horrible metric to, to use. It's, it's easy and like, we're totally guilty of it. That's one of our thresholds for even membership. So a guilty as charged, I, I'm going to slay myself along with everyone else that I slay here. Um, <laughs> we use it because it's easy. We use it because it's socially acceptable. It's way easier to say I do, you know, 3 million in revenue versus, uh, you know, I made $600,000 last year. It's also way easier to say I did 3 million revenue than, oh, I only made $20,000 last year. And that was, I didn't pay myself anything, right? <laughs> so, yep, yep. Um, but metrics that I think are most important one that, to be totally frank, in the community, we don't talk a ton about, a lot of our conversations really don't revolve around like what metrics should you track. Bottom line is a big one, of course. Conversion rate's a big one. Average order size is a big one. Um, repeat purchase rate is a big one. Um, and I'd say we don't have tons of conversations about them, but I think probably the most important ones to think about today are repeat purchase rates because advertising is, getting, is doing nothing but getting more expensive. It's getting harder and harder to get in front of people without paying the gatekeepers, the big tech gatekeepers. And so the more likely a customer is to come back to you and needing that product, the more likely you can actually build a viable long-term business. That's a big one. I think profitability per visitor is a huge metric. It's harder to calculate, but I, if I was going to run my business on one metric, it would be profit per visitor to my website. And the reason I say that is because it encapsulates a lot of things conversion rate, uh, traffic, all these different things. But it, it really makes you focus on pricing. If I would have to identify the two or, th you know, the one thing that I have done across multiple businesses in my life that has had the biggest impact 
and taken the least work, hands down, it would be pricing. Um, and so few people play with it. Some people can't, a lot of people can, and it's terrifying to price, change prices because we all fear that when you change the prices that your, your business is gonna disappear, but that rarely happens, especially if you do it in a really smart way. And what you should be maximizing uh, is your profitability per visitor, at least for new customers at a minimum. Um, so yeah, th those are some of my thoughts on, on metrics. And again, we don't, uh, total frankness, we don't talk a ton about, like that's not, those aren't the hot topics, but I think uh, those are some of the things to really think about. Yep. So now you've opened it up. What are some of the hot topics? What are some of the heated debates that are going on behind the wall? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. You know what? Let me, let me yeah, open up. it up. Let's see. I'm going to pull it up here. So that's we have good. a cool little feature uh, that lets us surface all the top discussions from the last year. So I can't, for confidential, I got to be, uh, need to be sensitive, but here's the, uh, here's some of our top stories from the last, let's say month. Uh, the story about how someone sold their brand, their, their, their business that they built over years, and like just the emotional roller coaster and what they learned and how they were able to hire multiple, how to use influencers on YouTube to build an eight figure business. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, the influencer one is interesting to me because it kind of um, brings about the question of like the social shopping experience and how like the US is so based right now. I mean, a lot of people are looking towards influencers, um, whereas other markets like China, are not really as much about that. It's more about like the social shopping experience. How, like, what were your thoughts or what was the debate when it came to the YouTube influencers and how they utilize that? And do you think that's like a long-term trend? Yeah, I think, I think the big themes I've seen is that uh, the really big influencers a lot of times are spendy and hard to track, but, but that you could potentially get a better ROI if you focus on, you know, helping uh, maybe, maybe working with smaller influencers, either for less money or just for product. Um, mm -hmm. so, cause it's, I, I don't know, I don't know about you, but when I'm on Instagram, uh, and I see a, somebody using a product and especially if they even mention it in any little way, I'm immediately a little suspicious. I'm like, is this person really like this product or are they just getting it comped and they're having to like fulfill their end of the, the agreement that they paid, you know, that they yep. signed up for. Especially the more popular they are. Like as it goes up to the like really popular famous people then I'm like, okay, do you actually use that whitening strip? <laughs> like how much are you getting paid for that? Yeah. And so I don't think influencer market is going away. I mean, we've had, you know, famous people endorsing things for, you know, decades, you know, maybe a hundred plus years, especially in the United States. But I do think, yeah, I just think you can also waste a lot of money on it if you're not doing it carefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree. So on your podcast, I'm thinking this is like self-servient, so we'll go with it. But what are some of the best questions that you've asked your guests before where you continue to get like the best answers or the best stories? Ooh, good question. One of my a couple ones, I would say, what's the last thing you apologized for? I think is an interesting one. That's a good um, one. I, I think another one is, is what's your number? Like what's, what's your number to be happy? Like if you had X in the bank and you know, what's your number where you'd be happy without having any more? Uh, it's interesting to get a sense you get you get numbers from all over the place from you know a million to a hundred million sometimes bigger so oh my gosh. Um, yeah a lot of the questions are very specific to the individual person and their story but for two general ones I'd say I like those ones and get some really interesting interesting ones those times yeah that that would be really interesting a good kind of peek into who that person is or how they think too I like yeah. that so I know we haven't gotten to talk about the capital arm of your business yet and I wanted to kind of go into what was it like starting a investment arm and what kind of challenges did you run into so far in the first four months? Yeah. Uh, so what it was like, it was terrifying. Um, <laughs> and I think- <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. Traditionally, you kind of have these two approaches where either you go out and raise a bunch of money and then you, you get all these commitments and you close on it and then you have, you have to go out and put this money to work. Uh, it's kind of your life for the next often 10 years. Uh, and that's a traditional fund route. The other route is what's called a syndicate and where you pretty much do deals on a deal by deal basis, which gives you a lot more flexibility. But the problem is every time you get a deal, you got to go past the hat and call a million people and half the people are out. And then, uh, you know, of those half, a quarter of them decided at the last minute, they, like the funding process is a nightmare on that side. And so I, I putting it together, I, I kind of did something, a hybrid of those two, where we have a, uh, a group of about 20 investors, uh, and that are tentatively in, I, I know them, they trust me, I trust them. And there's kind of a, 
uh, you know, they signed an informal thing that says, hey, I'm in for the next three years for this amount of money. So hopefully it gives us the flexibility to not have to go out and deploy money just to deploy money. But, you know, we also um, can be a little flexible uh, and have, and we can also have the commitment from some people to go for it. So that's totally on the, the technical fun side, probably mm -hmm. super boring to most people. Um, but in terms of some of the challenges, I think that the challenging thing is just the number of deals you have to look at to try to find a good deal. I mean, I've looked at over a hundred deals so far at some level of depth and uh, it's just finding a, just good companies B where it's a good fit for both parties and see where you can kind of see it working out well for, for everyone. Like it's just, it's really hard to find good deals, especially as a minority partner that comes in to invest, especially on the e-commerce side, because our approach and what we're trying to do is, is buy, invest in the long run with companies uh, to build profitable businesses. Like we're not trying to flip them. And I think in tech investing, you can get away with a lot of sloppiness because you're kind of swinging for the fences. And so if you have a bunch that don't work out, it's not a big deal. Most of them don't work out. But with e-commerce, like our model, you know, we're not looking to, we're looking to do singles and doubles. And it's, it's just hard to find really good businesses that you feel are going to be around for three to five years. So the hardest part for us has just been finding great businesses that we feel check out all our boxes. Yeah, that makes sense. Is there, or is there like a common theme behind what these businesses are needing capital for? Yeah, I would say, it's a, so financing for e-commerce businesses is tricky. There are some options out there. There's ClearBank, there's uh, PayPal Capital, Amazon Lending, all these things, but they're expensive. Uh, they also take a, you know, oftentimes they, you don't pay them back on a fixed rate. You pay them back on a percentage of revenue. So, um, which can be good and bad. So inventory financing is a big one. Um, but I'd say the people that we talk to, it's probably half and half. Half of them want money for inventory financing and to grow the business. And half of them just really would love to have someone who has, you know, spent $50 million on Facebook ads in their career, be able to help them and give them some high-level guidance on what to do and, and some thoughts there. Or, you know, someone who's uh, done a lot of importing to give them some, be able to, to tap into that knowledge base and that network. Yeah, I agree. When we were thinking about fundraising back in the day, I was like, I actually don't really care about people's money as much as like, are they going to help me? Like, I really don't want the most, you know, famous investor because I highly doubt they will spend any time with me. I want the person who's like ready to get their hands dirty and help me with like the nitty gritty stuff that I'm looking for help with. Oh, totally. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there has never been, there's so much money sloshing around right now. Right. And so there's a lot of places to get money, which is good if you're raising money, but it's, I think the real value add is the experience side and the money is just kind of a nice, nice perk that comes along with it often. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. So you've been looking at a lot of businesses and you have a lot of businesses in your community. What is one thing that you wish online sellers would either start or stop doing? I wish people would start having more fun with the copy in their business. That's a good one. I can't claim credit for this one, uh, but I've always liked to try to make like, you know, the copy and confirmation emails and things like that fun and interesting and and a little bit different as opposed to like, thank you for your order. Your order is 49732. We appreciate your business. Like yep. such a great, like transactional receipts are one of the most opened emails across all emails, shipping ones, absolutely. And like, if you're trying to build a brand, there's no better point to be able to, you know, have some fun and be able to be different and differentiate yourself, right? So I think that's a big one. You can extend that to, to the product packaging, to your website, all that stuff. But I would say... I wish they'd take a little more risks and have a little bit more fun. I, I would check out a site called mancrates.com. Have you heard of them? No, tell me a bit about them. Oh, they're so good. They're so good. Um, they just, they sell fun gifts for men. And so, for example, like instead of ordering your dad a tie, you can o order him a, you know, a 16 inch by 16 inch uh, crate, wooden crate of beef jerky and steak rub that he has to open with a, with a crowbar when it shows up at his house, right? Like stuff like this, it's different. Oh and their copy is freaking <laughs> yeah. just hilarious. So um, Ooh, check them good. out if I'll you're looking. check that out. Yeah, they're really good. I've, yeah, I've, uh, it, it's, it's just, you know, you're buying an experience for the recipient and people pay up for it. Yep. Yeah, now more than ever with people, you know, not going out as much, not going in stores and stuff, like you do have to figure out how to differentiate yourself. And mm -hmm. I think that's a good point that, I mean, right now I'm even thinking I bought something and I'm getting the actual like logistics email of like DHL or whatever will be shipped, you know, at this time. And like, it's all this other text that I don't care about. And it's like, okay, I actually don't care about this email that's coming through. And if they would have made it unique and fun and exciting, I like, I don't even know what this is that I bought. That's, that's how bad it is. Like there's no branding or anything. It's just coming apparently. Yeah. You know, like if, you know, if they were like the DHL guy had a wreck 
but your package was so important that he grabbed it from the fiery box and he crawled with one arm bleeding out and he handed it to the last person he saw and said, deliver this, deliver it to, to Stephanie. And then he died oh like, gosh. that might be intense and maybe it doesn't work for all brands, but it sure as heck gets your attention and you're like, whoa, this is interesting. That is awesome. You need to write for our brand. <laughs> I'm going to bring you on our team, Andrew, just to write your copy. I need that. <laughs> Oh man, that's good. All right. So I want to do a higher level e-commerce question because I just think you're one, you're willing to take a risk and you're willing to predict the future, which I like. I appreciate that. So I want to hear either what disruption is coming to e-commerce that's not already here. Because a lot of people have said like, oh, COVID's the biggest disruption. And like that answer's already been taken. So either the biggest disruption, or you can tell me what the future of online commerce looks like in five years. I'm going to say that I'll try to tackle both of them. Uh, biggest disruption is I think that that Man, and this is coming from the guy. You talk about being willing to predict the future. I made a bet with somebody when Amazon was $200 a share that uh, Alibaba was going to outpace it. And now that Amazon is $3,000 a share, uh, it's the, it was a humbling experience and it cost me a very expensive steak dinner. Um, <laughs> that being said, here's my prediction. <laughs> That's all right. I want your prediction still. <laughs> um, yeah, I would say the biggest disruptor, I'll throw a couple of things out there. I think text is going to be a big one, SMS, but that's not like a big disruptor as much as just a new marketing channel that us marketers can leverage for a while until we completely destroy texting for everybody, which will probably take three or four years. That's a good one, though. What are you thinking around using that as a new marketing channel? Oh, I just think, I mean, if you look at the, I think email, email is just getting harder and harder unless you really want to hear somebody's email. So I just signed up for the service. Hey, are you familiar with that? With from Basecamp? I've heard about it and I've seen a bunch of um, drama on Twitter about it. So. Yeah, <laughs> there has been that probably between like them and the app store and all that kind of stuff. Yes, yes. Yeah. So one of the one of the reasons I signed up for them is because they have this thing where you can screen your emails now. And the first time you get an email from a new sender, you can say, hey, I want this person to pop in my inbox or no, Johnny from Michigan. I don't care about your boat, you know, covers. Don't ever talk to me again. This is mm -hmm. unsolicited. And so that kind of thing, like, I think email is going to be, we're going to, there's going to be more and more tools and services that let you curate your email and really slice down who gets to hear from you. And so email is going to get harder and harder. But if you look at just text message delivery versus email, it's an order of magnitude, higher engagement, readability, click through, et cetera. And I think that, I think marketers are already, I mean, they're already starting to do that. People that I know that are on the leading edge have, you know, five, I haven't seen six figures, but definitely seen some good mid-tier five, five figure SMS lists and they just do really well. So problem is uh, you can be really careful because when people text me about things that I'm not interested in, like texting for me is very personal. I text yep. my, my, you know, I text my wife, my family, my good friends. Uh, you know, I don't text with uh, Bobby's boat shop in Michigan. And if he sends me a promotion via text, I'm going to be pissed off. And so you've got to be really careful about how you use that. Uh, but I think that'll be a big marketing channel going forward. So I'm not sure if that's a really disruptor and it's already kind of here in some regards, but I'll throw that one out there. Yeah, I like that. I think that's a good one, though, to think about it, like how to be careful when you start using these new channels, because completely agree. I've had, I think someone just texted me this morning who's like, I'm the education blah, blah, blah person of your district. And I'm like, what are you texting me right now? Don't. Oh, totally. You, you have to. Yeah, you can really. And I think there's some pretty stiff penalties for not being careful about that in terms of if you just spam people via text, which is good. Um, but yeah, it's nothing is worse than uh, nothing's worse than getting a text from someone you really don't want to hear about. Yeah, I agree. All right. So next we have a lightning round. If you're ready, Andrew, it's where I'm going to ask you a question and you have a minute or less to answer. Perfect. For each question. Yep. Awesome. Is there like a booing sound if I go over? So I stop talking. <laughs> That'll just be me. Boo, boo, boo <laughs> in the background. <laughs> do it. Do it. <laughs> All right. What's up next on your Netflix queue? Oh, actually in Arizona, uh, there's a place called Biosphere 2 where they locked okay. all these people into this kind of self-contained environment as like a training mission to go to Mars. And they isolated uh -huh. them from Earth atmospherically for two years. And surprise, surprise, it was a huge trauma fest. Can't remember the name of the movie, but that's what I'm watching next on Netflix. Oh my gosh, that sounds insane. Spaceship Earth is the name of the documentary. Spaceship Earth. Okay, I want to check that out. Very interested in that. And I also pontificate about Mars sometimes on our other show, Mission Daily. So it's perfect for me. Oh, perfect. Watch it tonight. <laughs> all right. Where are you going next for your travel destination when you can travel? Probably down Tucson, Arizona, where I'm uh, up in Montana right now, but for the school, probably, probably Tucson, Arizona, which is where we, we live. So 
cool. That's, no, that's kind of a cop out. I need a better one. Um, yeah. Wait, you live in Montana and you live in Tucson? Uh, we were up here. We spent some time in the summertime up in Montana to see family, that's friends cool. like that. Yeah. So we're heading back there soon. Um, don't have any plans at the moment, but the next big trip I would like to take would be to Mongolia. Oh, that would be very interesting. You have an Instagram. I'll have to follow along when you go there. Uh, at Capitalist Hippie. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, I will follow you. Um, if you were to create a Netflix original, what would it be about? Oh, this is easy. Uh, it would be, I'm fascinated with the question of where is the balance between running a business and being ambitious and chasing you know, kind of entrepreneurial success and having a great life and traveling and seeing your family and, 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 and nurturing other sides of yourself. And I feel like so few people get that right. Yeah. So my documentary would be pick 12 entrepreneurs from varying levels of that spectrum, live with them and follow them for two months each and try to come to some conclusions about if you're going to try to design your life to be able to maximize both of those, uh, where's the line? Yep. That's a really good one. I need help with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of us do. Yeah. What podcast guest are you trying to get on that you just can't get? Like they're just not responding and you really want them. Ooh, that's a good one. I think for a while we were trying to get Tim Ferriss on the show, which is super cliche and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. um, oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm still upset about that, Tim. What is the favorite piece of tech that makes you more efficient? Mm, good question. I would say text expander is a big one. So you can do saved replies and, and bump those out. Yeah, I'd say that's probably one of my one of my favorites. Asana is another great one. I love Asana uh, for we manage all our SOPs and long-term projects there. So I'd say those two. Yep. Yeah, I completely agree. I like them. All right, the last one, what new e-commerce tool are you hearing about that a lot of people in your community or outside of it are having success with right now? Mm, I would say there's a tool called Bonjoro. And it's not necessarily just for e-commerce, but it allows you to send welcome, like custom welcome videos to people really easily. Uh, if you think about sending a video to a customer, it's probably not the, the filming that's the hard part. It's probably like, the, okay, I have to film it and then I have to save it and then I have to edit it yeah. and export it. Like, and it just lets you kind of queue up these emails, send videos to people and for kind of a nicer customer service touch. So um, yeah, we use that for onboarding for a lot of our members and I've heard people have good luck with that. So. That's cool. Well, Andrew, this has been such a fun interview. Where can people learn more about you and e-commerce fuel? Yeah. Um, if you like podcasts, which at the end of listening to me talk and for, you know, 45 minutes, you probably you are more. A, a glutton for punishment. Yeah. I uh, would love to have you at the, as a podcast listener on the e-commerce fuel podcast. So you can you know, get that anywhere. You get podcasts, iTunes or, or elsewhere. Um, but yeah, the big home is just ecommercefuel.com. So you can learn about the community there. If you're a store owner and want to get plugged in, uh, or if you have a, an interesting business they're looking for uh, either money or probably more importantly, some, some expertise uh, from a group of really experienced e-commerce investors. Um, yeah, I would love to have a discussion with. So ecommercefuel.com is the best place for all that stuff. Well, it's been a blast, Andrew. Thanks so much. And we will see you next time. Yeah, this has been fun. Thanks for having me on. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Podcasts.